I'm so glad that you're able to join us today and uh, celebrate, remember, respond to uh, this amazing gift that God gave us in the cross. This last year, I have uh, witnessed, alongside of the rest of you, uh, our world being put through a very difficult time, our country, our businesses, our homes, our schools, our churches. So many things have been affected by this last 18 months. But I want to highlight in this introduction some of the things that make me pleased, that make me encouraged. I have watched people in our congregation who are teachers continue to fight for kids. I've sat in the, uh, I think of Lisa Hastings and... Um, and other teachers that are part of our group, or Jim Zerson. And, and I go into the school and pray with the teachers through this process, and I've watched them not lament over how hard their job is, but lament over how far, how far kids are falling behind, lament over the difficulties that have come for those children. I think of the people in our congregation that are part of the medical industry, Dr. Norbeck and, and Shannon and Juliet and Jeannie and others that step into, Michelle is here, and there are people who have stepped into harm's way a bit for us. And, uh, and I am inspired by them, and I'm thankful. Uh, I think of ministries that have been affected. I think of the Ericsons and how ministry has been hindered. I think of our elders. I would say that our elders, uh, this has been the hardest year by far none to be an elder at the Bridge Church. I would put over that, not fun. That's what, that's what I'd put next to what it's like being an elder in the last 18 months. Uh, my staff, uh, they came here because they love people, and I've been telling them for 18 months, you have to love people by staying away from them. That's a horrible way to do your job. Um, but with all of the inspiration that I've seen in others, and all of the uh, uh, holding it loosely, serving God that I've seen, in people, moms, dads, grandparents, uh, so many of us have struggled in this season. Nothing, nothing stands up as an illustration of what Jesus did for us. I have not found, like I, I sat there asking the Lord, what can I use for an illustration to begin Good Friday? And I've heard some tear jerkers, but nothing compares to what Jesus did for us. And the, the awkwardness of preaching about that night is found in the title, Redemption at Great Cost. We can talk about the cost and we can talk about redemption. We can call the cross beautiful and we can call it horrible. We can think about what Christ did for us and be completely sad about it. And the other moment, in the same moment, we can be completely excited because Jesus has done for us what no one else could. He's redeemed. He's restored. He's purchased us from among the dead. As we come together tonight, I want to consider that redemption. I want to remember. And it's okay to be sad. I want to celebrate. It's okay to rejoice. I want to honor our Lord and Savior. But ultimately, I think that a night like this demands a response. It de demands a response of faith. And we're going to see that in the story that's told in Luke chapter 23. In Luke chapter 23, if you want to turn your Bibles, beginning in verse 26, we're really picking up the story of the crucifixion of Christ that has been going on now for hours. We're just getting to the place where he's carrying the cross out of Jerusalem. A lot's already happened, and we'll allude back to it, but we don't have time tonight to look at all that Christ suffered. It begins with him stumbling and Simon of Cyrene stepping in to carry the cross. We're going to see that Jesus suffered for us, that Jesus saved us, and that Jesus sacrificed for us, but in all of this, the question is, how do we respond? In verse 26, And when they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, 
who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals on his right and on one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged rallied, railed at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, uh, for, but we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Would you join me in prayer as we begin to look at this amazing night when Jesus gave his life for us? Heavenly Father, I am never more sorry about my sin when I see what it cost you, what it cost Christ. And I am sorry for the sinfulness of this world, but I am so thankful for your sacrifice for us. I'm so thankful that we have hope, and I am so thankful that you are a God who loves even when we don't love you in return. In Jesus' name, amen. This story begins, and we're not going to go through this verse by verse, but we're going to look at some of the highlights. The story begins with Simon of Cyrene carrying the cross for Jesus, and he follows behind Jesus carrying the cross. Something that Jesus had already said, if you want to be my disciples, you have to follow me and carry a cross. Simon, in essence, becomes one of these that models discipleship for us. But why is Jesus not able to carry the cross? Because last night, the night before, on Thursday night, he didn't sleep. He prayed until he was taken, and then he was brought before ruler after ruler after ruler, and finally beaten and scourged, and his back was beaten till it was bloody and raw. He was mocked, he was slapped, he was spit on. And as he is exhausted, he no longer can carry the cross. So they grab Simon and they compel him to carry the cross. That's what Matthew and Mark say. They say they pressed him to carry the cross. Why is this significant? 
It is significant that Jesus has spent all that he is leading into the moment that he gives his life for us. That he willingly stepped into this story. And as we pick up the story here, how can it be that Jesus would give his life like this for us when he didn't, he wasn't compelled to by sinfulness, he was innocent. He's doing this for the people that are hitting him, that are beating him, that are crying out, crucify him, that are abandoning him, that are betraying him, that are denying him. All happening real time while he's giving his life for us. Simon of Cyrene had been coming in, in, in from the country. Cyrene is where in northern Africa, and he's come in for the Passover, presumably, and he is thrust into this story and becomes a prominent part of it, carrying the cross beam for Jesus. In verse 27, And there followed him a great multitude of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. It's interesting that the women who are mentioned in the story of Jesus' death and resurrection, not one of them is listed among the scoffers. The women are found crying over what's happening to Jesus, supporting Jesus, preparing Jesus, and visiting Jesus. But Jesus does something by turning to them in their lament and says, stop lamenting for me, stop weeping for me, but weep for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. He's speaking of the prophecy that he's already claimed about the judgment that's coming to Jerusalem in 70 A.D. That these women's children and grandchildren are going to experience suffering that is significant in the judgment of God. But this is also just like Jesus. Throughout his ministry, he is constantly focused on other people. I don't know how you would be responding at this point, but I don't think I'd be thinking about the women or their children at this point with my back raw not able to carry the crossbeam anymore. But God's love never ceases through this story that is expressed supremely through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They'll talk about the mountains falling on them, the hills to cover them. But look at verse 31. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? What does this mean? What about the, the wood being green? What does that mean? When one is alive, spiritually, morally, relationally, Jesus is the perfect man. He is the one who came and lived for others and suffered for others and laid down his life for others and served others. All he did was love people. That's what he did. His life is that green wood. What's going to happen to the ones that are dead? Well, Jesus came to bring dead to life. This is a warning. As he's going to the cross, he's warning people. Yes, Jesus suffered for us and we can give plenty of examples of humans suffering for humans and people laying down their lives, whether it's war or hospitals or schools or churches or ministry, wherever we look, there are people that emulate what Jesus did in some small regard, but nothing compares to the love of Christ that's put on display in the cross. The idea that one would die for his friends is something, but the fact that Jesus would die for the ones he created and the ones that are presently hating him and leaving him, the ones that dug the hole that they're in morally and spiritually, and Jesus died for them. And he says, don't weep for me. Jesus suffered for us, but that's not the point of Good Friday. That's not the whole story of Good Friday. In verse 32, we begin to see the example that God wanted us to see at this very moment. You see, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. 
And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. So here he is planted between two criminals. And we'll see that Isaiah 53, 12 lays prominently in this story as the fulfillment of this is described in the next few verses. Isaiah 53, 12 says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he will divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death. He was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. What we want to highlight in this first verse is that in, this, in the center of this verse is that he was numbered with the transgressors. This prophecy is that he is going to be hung among other sinners. But by being hung with other sinners, might, some might say, well, see, he's a sinner. And yet by being hung with other sinners, he brings life, the option of life for even them who are hung with him. You see, if you were to go to this story in Mark, you would find out that both of these who are hung next to him are casting insults at him in the beginning. Both are claiming, saying what, what is so common in Luke, the, the quotes that are being said are so ironic. Can't you save yourself? Why don't you come down and save us? Ha 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 ha. Look how weak Jesus is. And the very fact that he stays there on the cross is how he's saving them. And the illustration of that is found in these two that are on either side of him. In verse 36, the soldiers also mocked and coming up and offering him sour wine, saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. Everyone's having a good laugh at this point. Clearly he can't be king. Clearly, he can't save. Look at his end. But in verse 40, the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly? This is the guy on the cross next to Jesus that just moments before was insulting him. He's converted. And as you know the story, he hopped down and he served in the church for 20 years to pay back for his sins, and then he got back on the cross and died, and that's how he got to heaven, right? No, Jesus paid it all. This is the story of redemption. He's admitting that he deserves to die for his sins. He's admitting that he does, should not be allowed to get to heaven. He should not be allowed to be redeemed. He, would not, he, don't, he probably doesn't even understand what all of that means. But the Spirit has put it on his heart that this is the one, this is the Messiah, this is the Savior. He's the one that can actually save. And he does what any of us can do tonight. He declares that he is deserving of this death. But then he declares the innocence of Jesus. But this man has done nothing wrong. And now he turns to Jesus in prayer. And I I just want you to know that this is a moment when they are suffering, that they are near death. This is embarrassing probably. I mean, it was very cool for them to say, at least we're not Jesus. We're mocking Jesus. Let's join in and mock Jesus. If they choose to side with Jesus there's a good chance that they're going to fall under the same mocking that Jesus is getting right now. There's a good chance that the Pharisees and the scribes are going to cry out and say, not only Jesus, but look at this guy. His last breath is to sign up with Jesus, who's dying on a cross. And he said, Jesus, this is verse 42, remember me when you come into your kingdom. If you've chosen, if you've been converted, if you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, if you've been redeemed, if you've been restored, if you've come alive in Christ, I don't know what your prayer was when it started. I don't know if it was like mine, I give up, I can't fix this, you have to do this. 
And God began to blow the doors off my life as the Holy Spirit started breathing life into a 14-year-old screwed-up kid. This is what he died for. He died for me. And he died for you. Jesus suffered with a purpose. He suffered for us. Oh, the wonderful, horrible cross. How thankful I am that he died. And in verse 43, we see this salvation that only Jesus could bring from suffering. And he said, truly, I say to you, today you will be in paradise. I don't know if you know what paradise is, but in the, from scripturally speaking, it's, it aligns itself with the Garden of Eden. And we see the cataclysmic thing that Jesus is doing on the cross. If you go all the way back to the beginning of the story of redemption, it begins with the failure of mankind. And in a moment in time when all of heaven probably held its breath, Adam and Eve chose to fail, chose to walk away, and every generation that followed has confirmed their choice by choosing the same thing. We are sinners. We are the ones who walked away. And when he says to this man who would have been listed among the most sinful in his generation, and he says to him, this day you'll be in paradise with me, it means that the second act of God is bigger than the first act of man. That God's redemption is goes over the top of the choice of sin and over the failures that we've had and over the... Tell me you've been sinning your whole life. I had a friend in high school that told me, I am among the damned. I will not be redeemed. I've gone too far. I've done too much. He was in his 20s. And I said to him, there's no such... It's not true. Only believe. Only trust what Jesus has done on the cross. And there is no sin that's been accomplished that God won't forgive and redeem at the cross except, the, for, except for the sin of un, unfaithfulness, so the sin of, of uh, not having faith, the sin of choosing to not believe. And we are going to see those choices today in these people that are gathered together. Jesus suffered for us. Jesus saved us. Jesus also sacrificed for us. If you look in verses 44 to 49, it was now about the sixth hour. That's noon. There was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. For three hours, in some way, God turned the lights off. Anybody freaking out at this point? Maybe we made a mistake. Maybe we should have said the other guy, Bar Barabbas. What's happening here? What's going on in the story that darkness is covering the whole land? Well, we see the story continue. While the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. The lights were turned off. It became dark. As they're watching Jesus, darkness from a scriptural perspective can mean judgment of God. It can mean the absence of God, God pulling away. It can be a sign, you know, throughout this story, they were insulting Jesus, said, give me a sign. God's giving him a sign. This might be the one you want to pay attention to. And as it gets dark for three hours, this is not an eclipse that lasts for a short time. This is three hours of darkness. And, and yet it's tied with, Luke ties it with the, the veil of the temple being rent from the holy place to the holy of holies where access is being Opened. Is this judgment or is this salvation? Is this God pulling away or is this God drawing near? And this is the cross. The judgment of God poured out on the Son of God, the one who is innocent. 
And as his judgment is poured out on the Son, he wins for us unhindered access to the throne of God. What do you mean by unhindered? The guy on the cross next to Jesus in a short prayer, the trajectory of his life is absolutely changed and he will be in paradise with Jesus with the righteousness of Jesus being his. The saddest part of this story, apart from the Lord's suffering, is that people didn't choose to accept what Jesus did for them. And they're still choosing to not accept what Jesus did for them. In droves. People are walking away from this free gift and saying, no, that's not for me, I'll do it on my own. You see, Jesus suffered for us with a purpose. And because of that, the judgment of God fell on the Son of God, and access to God is now unhindered for all of us who believe. For all of us who say that prayer and and mean it. And we'll see the responses of people as we get to the end of this. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus has never stopped trusting his Father with this story. I don't claim to understand what it was like to be for Jesus to be both a man and a God, for him to be thirsty and God never thirsts, for him to be hungry when God never hungers, for him to suffer and God never bled. And yet it's his blood that saves us. And I don't begin to understand how he needed to cling to his father, but just earlier in the night before, he was praying to his father And sweating like drops of blood as he anguished over what was about to come. And he clung to his father. And he modeled for us what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, to be righteous. And here he is at the very end saying again, I Commit my, hand, I commit my spirit to you, and having said this, he breathed his last. And the only innocent man who ever lived died. The only innocent man, the only one who deserved so much more, the ones that he came to seek and save We're yelling, crucify him. We're mocking him and making sport of him and saying, tell us, prophesy and tell us who it is that struck you. (laughs) Our ugliest moment blossoms into the moment of hope. See, Jesus sacrificed himself for us. In verse 47, we see three responses to this story. In verse 47, now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God saying, certainly this man was innocent. Centurion is standing there watching this. He's fought for the clothes. Maybe he was there beating Jesus, or maybe he was part of the group that had scourged him. Maybe he was part of the group that went and found him. But at whatever point, he has been watching Jesus interact with people. He's been watching Jesus live by his own words. The fact that he cries out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, is just the fulfillment of what he told us it means to be a God follower. That you are to pray for those who persecute you. That you are to love your enemies. And here he is putting on display the Beatitudes. He's putting on display what it means to be Christian. If you've ever wondered, what does that look like to turn the other cheek? Look at the cross. 
and you'll discover what Jesus meant by what it means to be Christian. The centurion has been watching it, but he's not the only one who's been watching. Along the way, the centurion is not the first one to say that Jesus is innocent. Pilate said he was innocent. Herod said he was innocent. It's not the last time that he's going to be declared innocent, and people are going to see him and say, this is not, he's not guilty. The man on the cross dying next to him said, this guy's innocent. They even had a chance to hear it. And now the centurion is saying it again. Out of the most unlikely mouths, praise is being declared. Do you see him? He doesn't deserve to be there. Why is this happening? And I don't know if this centurion at this point became a Christian. We don't have any idea what happens with his life. But at this moment, he's confronted with the option of becoming a Christian. He has discovered that Jesus is innocent. Maybe you're here tonight and hearing for the first time the true story of what God did through the cross. Or maybe it's the first, maybe you've heard it throughout your whole life, and yet you've never responded. I hope that tonight is the night that the Spirit of God quickens your heart and you understand that it's your Savior who died on that cross. That He came to pay for your sin. Well, the centurion isn't the only one who responded. In verse 48, and all the crowds that had assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. Who are the crowds? Well, by the time the church in Pentecost begins, there's only 120 that are gathered, that are named in Jerusalem. So these crowds very well may be the crowds that were saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord seven days earlier. Maybe it's the crowds that were crying crucify him. Maybe it's the crowds that are just kind of hanging on and interested. Maybe it's the kind of crowds that only show up to synagogue two or three times a year. And yeah, man, Good Friday, that makes me sad. That's good. That's, it's good for me to remember that there are good people in the world that did good things. And... It's probable that these people that were part of the crowd that went home sad, realizing that a good guy had just died, missed the point. At least missed the point till the sermon of Peter in Pentecost. How many people are coming to Good Friday and Easter service and going home never receiving what God had intended them to hear and being saved? In verse 49, And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Somewhere off in the distance is the gathering of those who had come to Jerusalem with him. More than likely, this is his disciples and these women who are prominent in the story of his death and resurrection, who are crying with him, who are there at his feet for part of the time. And as it, at this point, when Luke comments on it, they're standing off and watching what's happening. They're witnessing it. Why is it significant that they're witnessing? For those of us who have been confronted with the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and have given our lives to Jesus, we are those witnesses still. Jesus wanted them to watch. God wanted them to see because the story wasn't over. And as hard as Friday is and as glorious as Friday is, Sunday's coming. And as they witness the promise of the resurrection on Sunday and look back at what Jesus paid for that promise to come true and that we who believe will be joined with him in his resurrection, hope? Eternal hope. Sin? What sin could God not overcome at the cross? Lost? 
It's at this moment that people are starting to be truly found. They've placed their trust in Jesus, but I don't think a one of them understands what Jesus is about to do and what God is about to do and what has been accomplished. But that's okay. He promised that he would give the Holy Spirit and, and the Holy Spirit would remind them of everything that was said so that it would be clear to them. My prayer is not that you would be sad tonight because Jesus died. My prayer is that you would not go home and, and just be amazed at this story that God did. My prayer is that your whole life would be changed as the Holy Spirit moves inside your heart and may the witnesses of God rise up and declare that he is risen and he died for me. Dear friends, it is a good Friday. It is a wondrous cross because the Son of God spilt his blood for humanity and one at a time people are being saved, even today. I pray that this Easter season, so many are saved from sin and death. Won't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for a story that was planned before the beginning of the world. Thank you for sending your son because you loved even when we didn't. Father, I pray that you would convict people of their sin tonight. All across the country, I pray that you would convict people of their sin and that you would convict them concerning righteousness and that you would bring them to a saving faith in your son. For we declare, those of us who have seen, those of us who know, those of us who have believed and been changed, we declare that there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.